Um, so welcome everyone um, to the, the session is called, What is the Farm Bill and Why Should I Care? Uh, my name is Margaret Chrome Lukens. I am the Policy Director at RAFI USA. Um, if you're just joining, we are going to be starting with a poll. Um, I will repost um, that link in the chat. Um, this is just to see who's in the room. Um, and I will also say, um, as people are filling that out, um, I think we do have a plan to send slides out um, at the end, uh, at, at some point after this session today, but I also want people to have access to them now. So I'm putting a link to the slides in the chat because the slides themselves are full of links that you can go back and reference um, later. So I want you all to have that too. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at who's in the room today. Um, this is what we've got so far. Um, can y'all see these charts? This bar graph, I hope. Um, looks like we've got three farmers, three faith leaders, um, some food and ag nonprofit staff. Me too, hello. Um, concerned community members. Whoops. Um, a policy nerd, <laughs> special welcome, <laughs> I hope to recruit a few more of you by the time the session is over. Um, academic or scientist and government agency staff. Um, awesome. So glad to have you all here today and welcome. I've just realized I haven't started my timer yet. So I'm gonna do that so that I don't go over because we have a lot of things to talk about. Um, so yeah, we'll go back to the slides. Um, I also would love to know another question. Um, so for this, you can respond in the chat, but um, I have a lot of various kinds of content to share with you today, but I am curious to know what questions do you have about the Farm Bill? Uh, I cannot promise that I have answers to all of your questions, but I can certainly attempt um, where I do have answers and there may be times where the wisdom is somewhere in the room. Um, so please feel free to put those questions in the chat um, now and also as you go along. Um, I probably won't be looking in the class at the chat super closely as I talk, but we are gonna pause for questions and um, potentially answers um, as we go along. Um, so please, uh, please don't be shy. I wanna know how it addresses issues related to farm workers. Would know, love to know the ways I can impact the farm bill as a farmer. Okay, we'll talk about a few of those things for sure. Um, and keep those questions coming. Um, let's start a little bit with a little bit of an introduction to um, RAFI USA, the Rural Advancement Foundation International USA. Um, I hope you'll learn a lot about us in the course of this conference. Um, but our mission is to challenge the root causes of unjust food systems, supporting and advocating for economically, racially, and ecologically just farm communities. Um, you can read a lot more about us on our website. I've included a couple links um, there in the slides. Uh, we have a number of awesome programs that are doing really awesome work with farmers, rural communities, rural faith communities. Um, and yeah get to know us. Um, and I am the policy director at RAFI USA. So um, I lead a team of awesome staff who work on policy issues, um, including the Farm Bill. Um, so that's the main topic for today. Um, and I'll say that there are so many um, kinds of important policy to work on and only some of them live in the Farm Bill. Um, and uh, so we're gonna talk about what's in it and what's not in it. But, um, and I will also say that that yellow linked text there in your slides will take you right to the, 20, the PDF of the 2018 Farm Bill. So that's a handy reference uh, if you need it. Um, the main things we're gonna talk about today are what is the Farm Bill overall? Um, what's in it? We're gonna go into at least a little bit of detail there. Um, you know, why we care, how to, navigate the farm bill, literally how to find stuff in the farm bill, 
um, how it all gets put together and how you can be a part of the process. So that's the preview for the day. Um, my second session is gonna talk about ways to be a more effective advocate. Um, and so if you're sort of interested in the how part of it, we'll get more into that um, at the next session later on in the day. This is gonna be a little bit more of the what. So what it is, is a giant piece of legislation also known as an omnibus, um, which is generally renewed every five-ish years or so. That's not, um, <laughs> that hasn't been completely consistent over the years. Uh, if you pay attention to Congress at all, you know that things do not always go as planned. Um, but the most recent one was in 2018. Um, and this whole bill sets the majority of federal policy um, that impacts our agricultural system, certainly not all of it, but a huge big chunk of it. Um, and the most recent version, um, the title of which is the Agriculture Improvement Act of 2018, expires in September of 2023, so September of next year. Um, the process to write a piece of legislation this massive um, takes a while. And so we have started it now. So it's, you know, it takes at least a couple kinds, uh, you know, a couple years and a whole lot of discussion and talking um, to get one across the finish line. Um, and it did take where a whole lot of money gets spent. Um, so the last farm bill's five-year cost um, for the mandatory um, programs it authorized was $428 billion, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Um, so that's that's kind of like the big picture look. We'll look at some of the specifics in a minute. Um, but before we do that, I have another poll for you. Um, this time, the questions are around uh, what you care about most. Um, and I'm realizing that the answers that I've listed um, may not be a complete encapsulation of everything that you care about, but just trying to get a sense of um, for the ones that we have down, what people are, uh, what rises to the top for folks. And I think you have the option to pick three there. So again, that link is in the chat. We can take a look at responses as they come in. This is so interesting to watch the <laughs> watch things go. So yeah, we um, we often have a lot of folks attending the come to the table conference um, who, you know, a lot of their primary work is around food security and fighting hunger. Um, so we are definitely going to talk about some of the nutrition programs in the farm bill. Um, we'll talk about some of the um, climate change or conservation programs, um, but really all of the things that we have listed here, um, some piece of them, you know, there are things in the farm bill that really matter and, and impact them. Um, corporate consolidation, there are other laws living in other places that also have an impact, but the farm bill definitely does too. Um, great. Well, thank you for responding to that. Um, and having taken a little bit of a look um, at the room, I also wanted to share um, where Rafi's priorities are currently. Um, and these are our 2020 policy priorities. They're not, which is not exactly the same thing as a farm bill platform because um, again, we work on a lot of things that aren't in the farm bill, um, but it is a pretty good view about um, what rises to the top for us based on the work that we're doing um, with people directly. And so our, and these are all linked. You can go read about all of the juicy details on our website, um, but the, the sort of four big buckets of priorities that we have for 2022 are equitable access to credit, local and regional supply chain resilience, um, finalizing strong packers and stockyards rules, which regulate um, 
Ideally, we'll do a, a better job regulating the conduct of giant meat packing companies towards the contract growers um, who are producing the food um, and equitable and urgent response to the climate crisis. Um, I really, um, I was so excited to hear um, Dr. Wilson's keynote this morning um, and also the panel discussion following it. And I was really appreciating the way that um, Dr. Wilson was making the connections between food insecurity and the bigger picture around um, racial wealth gaps, land loss, et cetera, because um, even though you don't see food security there as one of our top four priority areas, I think that a lot of the things that we work on really impact many of those underlying causes and it's all connected, right? Um, yeah, and our priorities really rise from the lessons that we learn um, in the direct work that we're doing farmers and community members um, and knowing that we don't necessarily have a program where we're working with all of the different kinds of stakeholders. Um, we might not um, have those stakeholder priorities as one of our own, but just because we don't work on all of the things doesn't mean that they're not all important. Um, so we try to um, stand in solidarity um, with causes where we might not be taking the lead um, and are just grateful to be part of this larger movement because um, it's going to take, it's taking and it's going to take all of us. Um, so big picture, what is in the Farm Bill? What is not in the Farm Bill? Um, we are going to spend some time on this leftmost green box about what's in it. So I have it listed here for the sake of having it up, but um, we're going to come back to it. But I will start by saying that what is not in the Farm Bill, um, nutrition programs are a little bit like some are in there and some are not. SNAP is in there. <laughs> um, school meals and the WIC nutrition program are not in the Farm Bill. Um, so there was a lot of really important stuff happening when the pandemic hit around um, like waivers for different kinds of school food that were was gonna allow schools to continue to try to provide food to students even when um, they weren't physically in school. So that's really important work, not in the Farm Bill. Um, labor rights are not in the Farm Bill. Um, so to answer at least one of your questions, there's not a lot in the Farm Bill um, concerning farm worker or food worker rights and protections. Um, immigration policy is not in the Farm Bill. Um, Neither is regulation of GMO genetically engineered products. Um, the Clean Water Act and the Clear Air, Clean Air Act aren't in the Farm Bill. Um, FDA food safety issues aren't in the Farm Bill. Um, as much as we would like some of these things to be in the Farm Bill, um, <laughs> they won't be. Um, many other things are not in the Farm Bill, but those are some of the ones that you might think would be. Um, so just kind of knowing the, the sort of scope uh, of things there. Um, and then the money in the Farm Bill, um, you'll see a few charts from the National Sustainable Ag Coalition in this presentation. They do a great job um, of publicizing helpful information. Um, they're one of the coalitions we're a member of. Um, so this one is from, from them. You can see that over three quarters of the Farm Bill is funding that lives in the nutrition title. And the vast majority of that is um, SNAP also known as um, food stamps or EBT. Um, if you're looking at the non-nutrition title portions of the Farm Bill, um, you'll see that it's sort of roughly thirds, crop insurance subsidies, commodity programs, um, and conservation programs. And then everything else is that little green or little blue uh, wedge. Um, so that just can give you kind of a sense of the big picture of um, how much things are costing. Um, so knowing that we are gonna dive into titles of the Farm Bill, the different programs in there, the process by which it gets made and how you can get involved, um, I did want to pause um, and check for questions. Um, and we will talk a little bit about the Farm Bill Conservation title in light of the climate crisis. Um, was a type of Farmers to Families program funded in the Farm Bill? Um, Bill, 
that funding came from giant COVID related packages. Um, and this is an interesting um, part of the picture now that I don't think any, nobody anticipated the pandemic, um, but a lot of funding um, with not a lot of details about how it was gonna get spent um, was appropriated um, for USDA. Um, and they've been using it in a variety of ways. Um, but that was, that was something that came out of COVID relief packages. Um, that said, I think that people, there are, there's a lot of interest um, because a lot of people had good experiences with some iterations of that program. I think there's a lot of interest in um, seeing it continue in some form. Um, so I think that that, I would call that fair game <laughs> for the farm bill. <laughs> Um, any other questions? I, um, we can keep it moving or also happy to take questions if people want to unmute as well as leaving them in the chat. Well, we can keep it moving um, and dive into what's in the titles of the Farm Bill. Um, so these are the titles from the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, the titles of the Farm Bill, they're basically like chapters. They uh, tend to be fairly consistent, um, but there can be some change over the years. For example, the 2018 Farm Bill had a livestock title. Um, we've heard some rumblings about um, maybe people are interested in a beginning farmer title, um, maybe a climate title, and a lot of that is going to depend on who's in power and who's in leadership and kind of how the narrative develops and where people are feeling um, pressure from their constituents. <laughs> um, so we're gonna walk through um, some of these titles, um, at least the ones that I work on. I don't work on all of them, so I'm not gonna tell you about the ones I don't work on, um, but we'll, we'll get into some details here. Um, there was a question about parity um, in the panel. <laughs> um, so the sort of brief, summary of commodities commodities pricing and parity is that um, in the 70s, President Nixon's agriculture secretary, Earl Butts, um, switched from the previous price control strategy, which was um, a supply management strategy. That strategy was um, basically taking surplus, buying up surplus, so taking it off the market um, to keep prices stable. Um, and or paying farmers to keep land fallow um, and then putting the supply back on market when the supply was low. Um, so that kept farm gate prices relatively stable for farmers. Um, and it was also a little easier on the land when land was sometimes being taken out of production. Um, so, and then in the seventies, um, in order to make food prices much lower, <laughs> um, they switched to a strategy of fence row to fence row. Earl Butts liked to say, get big or get out. Um, and so that uh, farmers were encouraged to plant as much as they could. Um, they were encouraged to invest in high-tech equipment. Um, and that strategy resulted in huge surpluses that were marketed um, overseas, often to the detriment of farmers overseas. Um, and farmers received subsidy checks because prices got so low, farmers received subsidy checks to account for those lower prices, um, which still did not stop tens of thousands of farmers from going under in the 80s farm crisis. Um, so that is essentially the system that we still have today. Um, and it is um, a pretty deeply entrenched system at this point. Um, you will sometimes hear the narrative that we need to get rid of commodity subsidies, but just having the awareness is that a huge, the reality is that a huge number of farms couldn't survive without them. So we need to think about what an alternative could look like instead. Um, you know, right now, for example, farmer, the prices of inputs are super, super high for farmers. So 
Um, there's not like a, a great or an easy solution, but fair farm gate prices um, would really help <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> um, and there are some links in the chat uh, or in the um, slides there, um, if you wanna take a deeper look at that. Um, all that said, this has been one of the more immovable parts of the Farm Bill um, in the past. So um, the political lift for changing that is one. Um, the conservation title. So this is the title which at present has um, a lot of relevance to climate change. Um, some of the programs that are currently in there are the Conservation Stewardship Program. This is a program that um, rewards and incentivizes farmers. Um, it's called a working lands program, basically meaning that farmers are being rewarded for implementing stewardship practices um, in land that's currently under production. Um, the difference, uh, there's also the conservation reserve program, which pays farmers to put sensitive or highly erodible land aside um, for a period of time. Um, and there is the environmental quality incentives program uh, which pays farmers, it's a cost share program um, for farmers who are putting up infrastructure um, or production practices that help the environment. Um, so those are important conservation programs that have an impact on climate. Um, we can maybe get into a little bit of a deeper climate conversation at the end of this session, um, but there's a lot of dialogue um, on the Hill right now about various approaches. There's um, quite a bit of bipartisan support for carbon markets. We have some concerns. <laughs> um, uh, and, and we can talk a little bit more about those, um, but it is a, a fairly, it seemingly fairly popular um, bipartisan solution. Um, and there are a couple other acts there that um, sort of take more of the approach of leaning into these existing programs that I just talked about, which have been proven to work over time um, constantly get more applications than they actually have funding um, to approve. Um, so there's a number of uh, bills that have been introduced or passed in one chamber um, related to climate. Um, so we can come back to that a little bit more, but um, I'm gonna just tell you that the third title is trade. Uh, we, don't, we don't really work on that one, so I'm not gonna tell you much more about it. Um, but the nutrition title, uh, incredibly important one. Um, and I also appreciated um, that Dr. Wilson made the point about um, the importance of the nutrition title being in the farm bill, um, that that makes the farm bill, um, that, is, that is one of the things that makes the farm bill work <laughs> in terms of getting the priorities that are important for a variety of people in one big bill that we can eventually pass. Um, so the Supplemental Nutrition Incentives Program, Assistance Program, I've got a typo there. Um, SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, is the bulk of that. Um, as we're talking about food as a human right and narratives that we create, one of the narratives that you see over time there is um, an attempt to put increasing restrictions on SNAP programs, SNAP eligibility, SNAP benefits, um, with this idea of like, who the quote deserving poor are as if everyone didn't deserve food. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of one of the narratives, you know, or, you know, or just great suspicion about fraud and cheating, et cetera. Um, but we know that SNAP is a really, really important um, program for addressing food insecurity and, um, and giving people a transition um, and, and support out of poverty. Um, the TFAP program is also in the Farm Bill, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, which provides um, food to food banks. Um, we have a close relationship with the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, um, which is formerly known as FINI. And so that's, um, I think it was Claire maybe mentioning the Double Bucks program, um, which can double the buying power for EBT shoppers. Um, at farmers markets and other places um, where they're getting um, fresh local produce. Um, and Rafi helps support a number of markets um, who run double box programs. Um, so that program lives in title four of the Farm Bill. Um, as does, if, if anyone here is familiar with various nutrition incentive programs at farmers markets, 
um, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, um, which is often sort of administered or run a little bit in parallel with the WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program, um, that is also in the Farm Bill. Um, and I, I really appreciated the panel this morning, but, um, and I, I wrote down something that Claire said, um, which was that concentrated food systems um, fail to feed people. We saw that during the pandemic in terms of supply chains, but I also just wanna note that they often fail to feed people, including their own employees. You know, Walmart will send out information about how to sign up for SNAP instead of paying people a living wage. Um, or if we're looking at giant meat packing companies, a large percentage of contract growers who grow for those companies live below the poverty line. So um, I think that it's important to remember, um, you know, to hold two truths at one time that SNAP is an incredibly essential program that we have to protect. Um, and that there are places where it's essentially subsidizing the cost of giant companies who are doing business because um, they are relying on SNAP for their employees to be able to feed their families rather than paying their employees a living wage. So moving on to some more titles. Um, credit, you saw credit on our list of uh, priorities, equitable access to credit. Um, if you're not a farmer, you might not know that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, is an agricultural lender. The Farm Services Agency has loan programs um, where they directly loan to farmers for um, annual operating loans, those annual costs of doing business, putting a crop in. Um, they have ownership loans if you're buying a farm. And they also guarantee loans for private lenders. So um, basically saying, listen, private bank, if you make this loan to this farmer and the farmer defaults, um, then we'll recoup you for 90% of the value of that loan. And that opens up a lot of private lending that private banks would not necessarily otherwise do, but they will because there's a government guarantee on it. Um, so a lot of different loan products at USDA. And again, going back to that like foundational importance of land and inheritance um, and the wealth gap, there's a lot in here in the ways that those programs are implemented um, that, that has huge impacts on equity and racial equity. Um, I was in a listening session with a farmer yesterday who was talking about inheriting debt uh, with a black farmer who was talking about inheriting debt along with inheriting the land um, or another farmer who was talking about um, his family actually having avoided USDA over the years as a farm survival strategy um, because USDA has a history of um, lending practices that have gotten farmers in trouble and in particularly um, gotten BIPOC farmers in trouble um, in ways where they have been treated unfairly, not been, been given access to the same opportunities, um, and we see many of those practices continuing to happen. Um, for example, um, saying that a farmer's loan needs to be collateralized far above the loan's value, which then puts um, potentially the farmer's home at risk um, or many of their other assets, um, or may just scare the farmer away from going through with that loan. And then they don't have the opportunity to grow and expand their business that other people um, who are not being told to over collateralize their loans might. So there's a lot in here. We have a lot of opinions about it. We're absolutely going to be engaging on it in the farm bill. Um, and um, it's, it's one of those things where if you don't have a direct relationship with it, it might be, um, you might not be as aware of it, but it's a pretty structural foundational issue. Um, Title six is rural development. Um, there's uh, a lot in here for rural in infrastructure and in particular broadband. Um, we don't work on this title as actively, but we know how important internet access is in rural areas. Um, and title seven is research extension and related matters. Um, I also appreciated Dr. Wilson um, mentioning um, the 1890s, um, historically black um, colleges and universities that are land grant institutions. 
Um, that's another place where the history of the USDA where racial discrimination um, shows up is in the inequitable funding of the cooperative extension was segregated um, and um, cooperative extension for farmers of color was extremely underfunded. And so that's part of the whole picture. Um, but funding for land grant institutions is in Title VII, as well as funding for a couple of programs. Um, the Organic Agriculture Research and Extension Initiative is where a lot of research on organic production happens. Um, and the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network um, is a recent program that funds um, hotlines and other ways to support farmers who are experiencing the mental health impacts of um, farm stress and financial stress. Uh, so that's a really important uh, program as well. Um, Title eight is forestry, which we um, haven't engaged on much. Um, so I will move past it. Um, Title IX is energy, um, primarily relating to things like um, biomass or biofuels and also some rural energy programs. Uh, Title X is horticulture. A um, couple important things living in here. Um, the local agriculture market program is a new umbrella for three previously existing programs that all help people market locally <laughs> their agricultural products. So there's a farmer's market promotion program. Um, Rafi receives funding from that program. Um, there's a local foods promotion program. Um, and there's also one called the value added producer grants program, um, which basically provides funding for farmers to take their products, add value in some way um, so that they can get a higher margin on their product. Um, so those are all things related to marketing um, that really help build um, local and regional um, food systems. Um, the horticulture title is also where the National Organic Program lives. Um, crop insurance, Title 11. Um, if you haven't thought about crop insurance much before, <laughs> uh, the thing to know, a couple things to know about it. Um, most farmers, most of the crop insurance policies out there are crop specific. So you would get an insurance policy for, you know, your 500 acres of corn. Um, and that would be one policy and you'd get another policy for soy um, or other commodities that you're growing. However, if you farm on three acres and you farm 30 different crops, uh, you wouldn't get an individual policy for each of those individual crops and it probably wouldn't even be worth your time. So Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program is an insurance program that is uh, built to serve farmers with uh, more diversified production, um, more so than trying to go with a crop by crop approach. Um, there are some improvements to make to the program in terms of the paperwork burden on farmers, um, but it is sort of the first of its kind. Um, and one of the one of the reasons crop insurance is so important is because when you're going in for your annual operating loan to the Farm Services Agency, um, crop insurance can be a really crucial part of your loan application cash flowing and getting that application, therefore. So um, having access to crop insurance um, is really related to having access to credit. And then Title 12, <laughs> after this, we are going to pause for questions. Um, title 12 is a miscellaneous title. One of the important things in this title is the Farming Opportunities Training and Outreach Program, which again is a new umbrella for some previously existing programs. One of those programs um, has historically been known as Section 2501 because its full title is Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged and Veteran Farmers and Ranchers. And it's faster to say Section 2501, but um, that's one of the very few programs that is um, specifically uh, targeted to farmers who have been historically underserved. Um, so it's a really important program. Um, and this farm bill is gonna be, this farm bill debate is gonna, there will be a lot of conversation about the definition of quote, socially disadvantaged, which on the, it is not a term that many of us love because it's kind of insulting. <laughs> um, 
but it is a term that has um, legal standing in a lot of programs and it there are many programs that are built off of the definition of this term um, in terms of having funding set aside in a program for quote socially disadvantaged farmers. Um, so the definition of this term really matters and has also been somewhat under attack uh, around this time last year, the American Rescue Plan Act passed and it included um, debt relief for BIPOC farmers, um, which the USDA was in the process of figuring out how to administer. Um, and again, that debt relief was related, was in there because of the decades and decades of discrimination against farmers of color. Um, and before farmers got checks, uh, USDA was hit with around a dozen lawsuits from white farmers across the country claiming that they were being discriminated against for not getting debt relief. Um, those lawsuits are still happening. Um, the outcomes are unclear. Um, but there will be a lot of conversation about that term, because if that term is um, invalidated by the courts, then that has pretty wide in, widespread impacts on a lot of existing law um, and a lot of the ways that uh, legislators have attempted to make things a little bit better. Um, so that's a conversation that will continue in the Farm Bill discussions. The other sort of half of the Farming Opportunities Training and Outreach Program um, is the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. So a couple of programs there um, targeted to farmers who have historically not been well served by USDA programs. So that was a lot, but it was really just touching the highlights. <laughs> There's so much in the Farm Bill. Um, we're gonna take a look at it. It's 530 pages, the 2018 version of it. Um, so that was actually a pretty quick skim, even though it wasn't very quick. <laughs> um, but let's pause. Um, curious what questions folks have, throw them in the chat, or um, I think that you also have permission to unmute yourself. I guess I'll also say that um, even if you didn't hear a bill that you're excited about, like in a particular title, um, it, it might still fit somewhere, right? Um, one of the questions in the panel this morning was around local processing. One of the acts that Rafi has um, supported as a marker bill is the Strengthening Local Processing Act, which does a variety of things, including trying to provide some supports for small and very small plants to comply with um, regulations uh, you know, around inspections and food safety. Um, because those are things that can really raise the cost of doing business for small and very small plants. Um, and so that's something that will be that I didn't mention here, for example, um, but that we will be continuing to advocate for in our farm bill work. Any recommended videos or online sources for teaching youth and adults about the farm bill? I don't know of any videos that come to mind for me immediately. There are some links a little bit later on in the in the presentation that are sort of like an introduction um, to the farm bill. So I think those would count as an online source. Um, so yeah, well, there will be some links to those later on. Um, GAP certification connected to the farm bill. Um, Fairly sure that's a yes. Rafi does not work on um, food safety as much. So that's not a policy um, thing that I have dug deep into. Um, so that's something that I would have to double check. A large part of my job in policy is figuring out where things live uh, and, and knowing how to research where things live. Um, Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative and interesting. Um, I'm curious about were there resources available to help you learn more about the USDA funding? I've contacted like local um, 
I guess, ag agencies for the application. And it seems as if like their assistance is very limited. So I was wondering if there's some tool or entity that you know of that assist uh, with applications or perhaps provide more information about the process? Yeah, I think the answer to that question largely depends on what kind of USDA funding um, because they're farm loans. for what farm loans farm loans like, yes um you can get in touch with Rafi <laughs> um to talk about farm loans um we have a a position starting soon actually for someone who was will be dedicated to helping people with FSA farm loans um yeah there are so many kinds of funding that come out of USDA um, and one of the things that they've been doing a lot recently is quote cooperative agreements where they're basically um, paying organizations like Rafi to provide a little bit more of that assistance um, because it is not always forthcoming from the local office. Um, all right. You. Yeah, absolutely. We also have some questions about the Fresh Produce Procurement Reform Act being considered. Um, I have to say that um, specific questions about specific acts are ones that I might not be able to get into on this call um, because there are so many out there, um, but would be happy to follow up um, on that question. Um, I think uh, I think Rafi is generally supportive, um, but not prepared to get into the details of it with you today. Um, but thank you for all the, the questions. Um, so let's continue for now. Um, I'm excited about this next section. We're going to go look at the farm bill. Um, and we're going to do it through congress.gov. Um, and doing this not because I'm expecting everybody to go read the whole farm bill, but I want people to know where they can go read laws that have been introduced and laws that have been passed. And this is a place you can do it. Um, and so we're going to take a quick look at it. So it's something that you feel like is accessible to you. Um, I think the more transparency we have, you know, the better functioning democracy we have. So this is a good transparency tool. Um, so we're going to literally go to congress.gov. A lot of stuff lives here. Um, we are going to concentrate today on legislation. So if you go up into the top left, you can search in particular for legislation. Um, searches are faster and easier if you know a bill number. In this case, I know a bill number. We're not going to start with the farm bill. We're going to start with S2023. And we are going to find the Relief for America's Small Farmers Act. This is an act that um, Rafi has supported over the course of a couple years, um, providing debt relief to small farmers. Um, you'll see in the tracker that it has been introduced that it hasn't become law. Um, this is what's known as a marker bill, which is um, a bill that the legislator introduces without the realistic expectation that it will get passed on its own, but with the hope that it's going to get scooped up into a larger package. Um, a lot of our work this past summer and fall was um, trying to make sure that the most important provisions of this act got scooped up into the Build Back Better Act. Jury's still out on that one, or rather Congress is still out on that one. Um, but you can go and you can click on the bill in congress.gov. Um, they'll often have a summary. You can see who has co-sponsored the bill. Um, and you can go in there and you can read the bill text. Um, some, some laws are really long and some are actually pretty short and quick to read. Um, so don't be afraid to get in there and check them out. Um, we are gonna check out um, the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, which is the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018. Um, and we are going to, um, to make the search a little bit easier. We're going to limit it to just 
the Congress when it happened. So you can see right now we're in the 117th Congress. The last farm bill was passed in the 115th, which was 2017 to 2018. Um, and you can see that there's, so we've got it right here, we're gonna come back to it. You can see that there are a lot of ways to sort and find things on congress.gov. Um, so right now we're just searching for legislation. You can look for other things. Um, you can search for which Congress it was. You can search for which chamber. Um, you can search for status of legislation. Um, you can go look up your representative and see what bills they've been sponsoring, or you can track activity in a committee. Um, so a lot of options there. And then like any good search function, um, you can get rid of um, search parameters that you've already given it. Um, but we're gonna go look at the farm bill, uh, which is this one, Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018. Um, and you can see, this is the one to look at. It became law. A couple, we'll talk about you know versions, drafts of this act that will come through, but this one saying that it became law helps us know that it is the correct one. Um, and here we'll go and we'll look at the text. Uh, you could scroll all the way down this page if you wanted, <laughs> or you can download a PDF, which is what we're going to do. So now we're looking at the most recent farm bill, all 530 pages of it. Um, I'm not expecting anyone <laughs> to read this, but there are some tips for um, navigating your way around and finding the sections that you need. Um, so we've talked about how the farm bill is divided into titles. We went through what those titles were and each of those titles will have subtitles and sections and subsections, et cetera. Um, but I encourage folks to make good use of the table of contents at the top. It's only 10, 12 pages, <laughs> um, but it helps if you know, okay, I'm looking for something in the nutrition title, I'll go find title four. Um, and then it's a relatively quick read. Um, and then one of the biggest things that I use for farm bill or really any legislation is just the word search function. So control F um, in particular, if you're using the table of contents at the top and you see that something has a particular section number, you can search for that section number and it'll often take you right to that section. Um, the page numbering is not great uh, or really useful in the farm bill, but if you have a section number, you can get there quickly. Um, another thing that you will notice uh, if you start looking at legislation at any point is that a lot of it refers to and then amends previous legislation. Like they don't put the whole old law in there for you to see, um, which is another reason that congress.gov can be a handy tool if you wanna nerd out on it, um, like I sometimes do. Um, and then here is the slide with links to like the summaries and breakdowns um, that someone asked about earlier. Um, so we're gonna actually go back and we're just gonna do a quick example of finding something in the farm bill. Um, in this case, we are gonna find um, the Gus Schumacher in Nutrition Incentive Program. So we know that that's gonna be in the nutrition title and here it is. It's in section 4205. So I'm gonna do a control F and this, <laughs> this is what I was looking for before, but we put 4205 in here. Um, and we searched for the next one and we landed on page 168 um, where this section lives. Um, and so you can see that this is where amendments to the, the previously passed law is. Um, and read that section. So because it's such a huge piece of legislation, I just uh, wanted to spend a little bit of time like demystifying how to find it, where to get around in it. Um, and I don't think that you have to um, be reading legislation all of the time in order to be an effective advocate, but I want I want people to know that it's like not impossible and it doesn't have to be scary. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about 
the process um, and um, how it works for the farm bill. Um, I will say that um, a big part of my job is figuring out exactly when we want a change to be made, like where does that change live in the process for us to be working on. Um, there are, for example, a lot of a lot of regulations have a really huge impact, um, but that the process of rulemaking for a regulation is a separate process from lawmaking um, often, or a law will say this regulation shall be made, and then there is an official process that USDA goes through that usually involves public comment. Um, and, and then some things live in like a handbook at an agency about how to administer a program. So for the farm bill, um, conversations that we're having so far, a lot of the things that we're asking are, is this something that we need to put in the farm bill in order to get this change done? Are there easier ways to do it? Should we be trying for both? Um, but it's important to know that the process of making policy change is just so much bigger than getting particular laws passed. That said, <laughs> getting a good farm bill passed uh, is a big and important thing. Um, and the, the passing part of that is what is called authorization. Authorization is getting laws passed. Um, and actually, I will go to the next slide. Um, this year, we're doing a lot of work on implementation and also pre-authorization. So pre-authorization um, is what we're in right now with the Farm Bill, where basically the conversations that are shaping the bill are starting to happen. Um, Congress has been holding some hearings on various issues. Um, coalitions are getting together and talking about priorities. Um, people are working on developing champions. Um, so who is the legislator that is gonna take this on at their cause, introduce the bill for it, fight for that bill's priority and committee and try to get it across the finish line. So developing relationships with members of Congress who will do that on your issue. Um, and of course, um, cultivating spokespeople. So who are the people who can speak uh, to why this bill is important with their personal story and do that in a powerful way to the media or to members of Congress? Um, and you know, also part of pre-authorization is um, sort of developing marker bills um, and support for those marker bills. Um, we will talk about the specific authorization timeline on the next slide, but also just to note other important steps in the process. Appropriation is a similar process to authorization, but it's basically the yearly budget process um, that funds <laughs> things. Um, the Farm Bill will include um, a couple kinds of funding. It will include mandatory funding for a program, in which case that program will get that funding, um, but it may also include, uh, it'll say this program is authorized for up to this amount of dollars um, of discretionary funding, which means you have the option to fight for it in the appropriations process. So um, some programs may be authorized without any funding, um, and you could still see that as a step forward, but knowing that your job is not complete without also getting funding for it in the appropriations process. Or maybe your program didn't get as much funding as it needed, um, mandatory, and so you're fighting for additional funding to get it where it needs to be. We also sometimes play defense on appropriations um, where people will come after money um, for your program, um, or particularly um, the, we have played defense where um, and stockyards rules have uh, basically come into the appropriations process and attached riders that say, USDA, you're not allowed to spend any money making these new rules that could help protect farmers. Um, so a lot can go on <laughs> in appropriations. Um, implementation, we've been doing a ton of implementation work um, over the past couple of years. Um, it, of, it may often depend on um, how open to feedback an administration is. This administration has asked uh, for a lot of kinds of feedback um, and also been open to conversation. Um, one of the things they'll do is they'll put out a request for comment. Um, so in 2021, some things that they requested comments on, which Rafi submitted comments, um, they asked about supply chain resilience. This was in the context of the pandemic and its impact on the food system. They asked, how should we spend this giant pot of money 
um, which is going to be generally for expanding meat and poultry processing capacity. We talked to 15 farmers and food processors and other stakeholders and submitted a comment on that. Um, so that is one kind of implementation work. Um, it is also when a program um, has been authorized and then funded, how will it be administered? Um, are the app is the application process going to actually be accessible to the people that the program is supposed to support? Are they going to hear about it? Um, and those are places where organizations like RAFI um, try to do a lot of work um, to try to get those, make sure that that funding gets where it needs to go. Um, and then evaluation and oversight um, is also important. Um, the, uh, I don't know if y'all remember it, tariffs and the market facilitation program, which happened in the last administration. Um, it was, it was payments to account for the financial hurt farmers were feeling because of tariffs that had been enacted. Um, and people did some data analysis afterwards and found that over 99% of the dollars that were dispersed through that program went to white non-Hispanic farmers, um, which is uh, a way that inequity gets perpetuated. Um, so it's important to be looking at those things. Um, We'll dive a little bit more into the authorization process specifically. Um, again, thanks to National Sustainable Ag Coalition for their great graphics. But um, after all of the marker bills have been swimming around for a while, um, the agriculture committees in the House and Senate will each draft a version of the Farm Bill. Sometimes one of them will wait on the other one to take a lead, but they'll both have a version. Um, and when those versions are passed, they'll go to conference committee where negotiators from both chambers will get together and hash out some kind of middle ground differences in the two bills. Um, and they will typically hash that out until they're both pretty sure that their respective chambers will pass the bill that they have hashed out. Um, and once slash if both of those things happen, then the final bill passed by both chambers of Congress gets sent to the White House for the president to sign or not. Um, so many steps along the way for people to hold up the process for various reasons. Um, and also many of these negotiations, of course, it's, it's like a fully political process, um, depending on who has power and who has leverage and who gets listened to most. But one pretty important thing to know about this process and the way that we relate to it is that at every step of the authorization process, the opportunity for influence shrinks and the number of people with power over those decisions shrinks. Um, so we, and that's largely, you know, committee chairs. So the chairs of the house and Senate Ag Committee have a lot of power. The members of those committees have a lot of power, but even the members of those committees have less power as fewer and fewer people are negotiating. Um, you'll have White House negotiators in there at the end. You'll have um, leadership from uh, both parties in terms of, you know, what they definitely, definitely, definitely won't pass with their caucus, et cetera. So, that means that now is a really great time that that like marker bill formation, narrative formation time is a really great time for us to get involved. And we were going to stay involved till the end. Um, but earlier is better. Um, and just like a kind of broad look at how we think things will shape up in terms of that whole process. Um, this spring, we're going to have hearings and scoping um, about what people want to tackle that's going to continue on the agriculture committees. Marker bills will be introduced um, and there will be a lot of public media and narrative engagement by lawmakers and advocacy groups. You see some of that narrative engagement happening already in hearings where uh, members of Congress are kind of going on record about what they think about an issue in a hearing, um, picking witnesses carefully to try to um, advance particular points. Um, this summer, it's possible some field hearings, so hearings that are in district instead of in DC. Um, and people will continue to develop bill text and markers 
There's also an August recess um, where both uh, legislators from both chambers will go home. And that's a good opportunity for us for in district engagement, inviting people out to your farm, building relationships. We will see more marker bills in the fall and we'll see some maneuvering um, for priority within committees, but also campaign time. So less is gonna get done in Congress. Um, and depending on results of the elections, um, we may see some shifts in committee membership um, and one or both chambers may change control. Um, so that will impact the political calculus of what's possible and what kind of messaging um, may be compelling, et cetera. Um, and then <laughs> there's a lot of guesses in 2023. Um, hypothetically, it could happen where initial text comes out of committees in the spring, maybe. They might vote on it in the summer. They might do conference committee and pass it in the fall. Who knows? We can cross our fingers. <laughs> um, but that's about as much predicting as we can make at this point, I think. Um, but that's just kind of a big picture of where we're going. So um, I want to plug. <laughs> um, it's a lot to keep track of. And um, it is is my job to, to do that for a large part of my week. Um, but if it's not your job to track these things, then I would say that is a value add that Rafi wants to help provide. Um, knowing that you know our priority list may not be a 100% overlap with yours, but hopefully a good piece of it. Um, and so what we can provide is letting you know when relevant marker bills get introduced. Um, knowing that they're not gonna pass on their own, it is still really good and really important work to speak up for those marker bills when they're introduced because that puts them in a stronger position for inclusion um, in the whole farm bill. Um, and so we can use our time and our DC connections to keep track of that stuff and let you know. Of course, you are bringing a very important piece of it. The more people who are speaking up for this, the better. Um, and in particular, if you're a stakeholder, you know, if, if you're impacted um, in some personal way by some pieces of this legislation, you can bring, I really appreciated Dr. Wilson's point about proximity and we're gonna talk more about it in the next session, but lawmakers need to hear from people who are gonna be impacted by these laws. And if you are one of those people, you telling your personal story about it is really important. Um, that could look like editing the template that you see in our action alert to tell your personal story. And it could also look like closer involvement with Rafi to talk about how you can tell that story and tell it effectively to your member of Congress. Um, our commitment, my commitment to you is that we will only send you action alerts when we think it will make a meaningful difference. If you are like me, there's a lot of trash coming into your email inbox <laughs> um, and not all of it is useful. A lot of it is just trying to get your contact information, build their network, or maybe sell your information. We do not do that. We will send you things when we think it is a good use of your time and not when we don't think it is. So um, there are of course many organizations out there doing great work on the farm bill. Um, but I, yeah, um, and we work with many of them. Um, if you wanna hear specifically from us, sign up for our action network. <laughs> Um, I'm looking, I think we have about 10 minutes left in the session. Is that correct? Um, so I think that we could take some time for questions and answers. We could dive a little bit more into those climate questions. I didn't know if you had a specific question, um, Dennis, or just wanted to sort of go over the landscape a little bit. Um, and I know that we also are encouraging folks to fill out the surveys, which you can access through your attendee hub. Um, but yeah, please feel to feel free to throw questions in the chat or um, unmute yourself and we can have a little discussion. Or if it's not a question and you just have been working on policy or farm bill issues and want to add something, um, please feel free to. Um, other wisdom, also welcome.
Any other questions from folks or comments or ponderings? Would love to know the ways that I can impact the farm bill as a farmer. Yeah. Um, I think this is about telling your story um, and um, honestly, like would love to work with you on it. Um, <laughs> both what are, attend the next session if you can. <laughs> we'll talk about uh, ways to increase the impact of your advocacy, um, different ways that you can advocate um, and kind of um, different levers that you can push to have an impact. I do wanna give an extra plug if folks live in Alma Adams or David Rouser's districts, um, double extra please get in touch with us, <laughs> sign up for the Advocacy Network um, because they both uh, are appointed to the Ag Committee. And so they are gonna um, have a little more influence than someone who's not on the Ag Committee. Um, but yeah, as, as a farmer, I think it's, um, getting in touch with your member of Congress. There's also ways that you can um, be heard even if you're not speaking directly to them. Um, letter to the editor in your local newspaper. You know, there's, there's sort of a media strategy as well, getting your story and your issues and your priorities out there um, all the way up to like a lobby visit with your member of Congress. And those are things that we do with farmers um, and as long as it's in one of those um, sort of priority areas um, for us, because we have limited limited time and energy, but if it's, if it's along one of those priority um, areas for us, then um, helping support um, lobby visits to members of Congress is definitely something that we do. So those are a few things that you can do. Um, awesome. Um, Awesome, we've got a hub for environmental justice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, or if you know farmers who are located in or feed people in Alma Adams or David Rouser's districts, um, let us know about that. Um, great, also have uh, some suggestions on that form. So thank you, we will update that. Appreciate that feedback a lot. Um, and thank you, Sabine, for the reminder. Um, please go to the attendee hub and fill out the survey for the session on the right-hand side of the page. Thank you so much for joining, y'all. Um, hope to see you in the next session if you have time and can make it. We're going to talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of policy advocacy more so than the Farm Bill itself. Um, and yeah, hope to, be, hope to be on this Farm Bill journey with you as we go along. So thanks.